thank you all for being here. Um, if you don't know me, I'm Dale Nesbury, and I'm the president of Muskegon Community College. And welcome to this, I believe this is the third um, After Ferguson event. Uh, it's, it's nice to see, um, frankly, a bunch of young people here, because you are the folks who are the ones who, 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 who need to share with us, um, the old folks, um, how we can move forward and make um, our society function much more effectively than, than we have um, given, given our backgrounds and our histories. Um, and for those who, who don't know my background, just very briefly, I'm, I'm your friendly neighborhood college president, but in the past I was a law enforcement official and um, I've done lots of doctoral work um, and, and afterward on, on law enforcement behavior and what, what drives uh, police to do the things in the way that they do from their training and their, their backgrounds and activities. So, so it's, it's personal for me. Um, I'll also say for those in the audience and those on, on the panel, um, one of the things that I've heard in these groups, our, our group, our Ferguson group and some other community groups is that, you know what, um, so we're having these meetings, we're talking with each other, what are we gonna do, what are you gonna do? And you are you, you are them. You are the people who are going to make the change that, that we need here. So, so in addition to coming to these sessions, uh, take some action on your own. That's the most important thing that you may do. But I've, you know, frankly, um, I've talked too much. Thank you, panel, for being here. And uh, Dr. Andy Weibel is our moderator, so I will turn it over to Dr. Weibel. There you go, sir. Thank you, President Nesbury. Um, I'm Andy Weibel. I teach philosophy here at MCC and uh, also currently chair of the Arts and Humanities Department. So let me just introduce our panelists real quickly. Um, first off is uh, Director Jeff Lewis. He is a, uh, he's currently the Director of Public Safety for uh, the Muskegon Police Department. He's had that position since 2011. Uh, he has a bachelor's degree and master's degree from Eastern Michigan University and was a police officer for many years in Ypsilanti. Uh, before coming to Muskegon, he was the chief of police in, uh, is it Milan, Michigan? Or? Milan, yep. Milan, all right. Milan. <laughs> Milan. I'm, actually, I'm actually going to Milan soon, so <laughs> I thought, ah. Uh, uh, Director Lewis is a member of many service organizations and boards, uh, including Every Woman's Place and the YMCA. Uh, next to him is uh, Darnell Blackburn. He's coming from uh, the Detroit area. And uh, Dar Darnell Blackburn uh, works for the Michigan uh, Commission on Law Enforcement Standards, which sets the standards for law enforcement in Michigan. He's been in that position for the past 12 years. He is also uh, uh, has been a police officer for MSU and the city of Auburn Hills, Michigan. Um, he is the founder and CEO of Pratt, which is a consulting company in conflict management, customer service, and cultural competence. Uh, he has his bachelor's from Michigan State and his master's from the University of Phoenix. Next is prosecutor DJ Hilson currently the Muskegon County Prosecutor. Uh, he was elected to that position in 2012, and he's been working for the prosecutor's office since 1999, after his graduation from Thomas Cooley Law School. He's a member of many civic organizations and boards in the Muskegon area. He's currently chairman of the Child Abuse Council and the Marijuana Prevention Task Force. He frequently works in the community with neighborhood associations and local schools. Next is Chief uh, Lynn Gill. He's the Chief of Police at Muskegon Heights. He's held that position since 2009. He is a graduate of MCC. Yay, hey, all right. Um, GBSU and the uh, Mid-Michigan Police Academy. He's been an officer with the Muskegon Heights Department since 1990. And finally is our own Nicholas Budimir who is a sociology instructor at MCC. His areas especially are class, race, 
Inequalities Work and Capitalism. He teaches many different sociology courses, and for the last two years, I believe it is, uh, he's taught a very popular labor studies course. So, Nicholas Budimir. So, it's our panel. Um, I thought I'd start off by just review. This is called After the Ferguson Report. And so I just want to show you two slides. One, some uh, what findings they had from the Ferg when the uh, Department of Justice investigated Ferguson and what happened with Michael Brown and the police department. And second, uh, some recommendations that they had. So I know the panelists might break their necks, but if it's behind you. So um, just quickly, so Ferguson report findings. They found uh, racist emails. One email said that a man was trying to get welfare for his colored, lazy, and non-English speaking dogs. And another email, Obama was called a chimp. Uh, they found racist policing, stopping African American drivers without suspicion in greater numbers, uh, arresting without probable cause, and using uh, unreasonable force. There was uh, racial bias. African Americans were twice as likely to be searched after a stop, uh, but had contraband 26% less of the time that they were searched. The bias continued in municipal courts. Uh, Racial-based use of force, 90% of cases, for example, that uh, used force were against African Americans in Ferguson. Some recommendations from the report. They made a bunch of them, but here's four main ones. Uh, the police needs to be, have uh, more connection to the community. And they offered some, some, some suggestions to get there. Uh, there needs to be more supervision and oversight of police officers. They should not be arresting whoever they want. Uh, De-escalate situations even when force could be justified. And stop using steep court fees and fines as a way to fund the city and install a permanent system of leniency rather than occasional leniency periods. Um, so those are some of the suggestions from the, um, and findings from the, the Department of Justice's look at Ferguson. I guess I'll start with uh, Director Lewis. Can you say, what are some things that uh, you've learned? We, we met, you were on the panel back in February we had at MCC. This report came out after that time. Is there anything you learned from the Ferguson report that you think is applicable to Muskegon? Well, you know, there's, there's a lot of information out there on this Ferguson report. And um, obviously I was as interested as you were when it came out. And I actually brought a lot of stuff that I had printed out and reviewed to see what we're doing, if there's any similarities or if there's things that we're not doing that they did and vice versa. But a few things stuck out at me right away is the fact that um, I started my law enforcement career full-time in 1978, and I was pretty, pretty disappointed, pretty shocked at some of the things I saw on the surface as I read those, because I don't believe we practice a lot of those things. But one thing that did stand out to me that I thought was kind of unique is uh, in the Ferguson Report, one thing the Justice Department noted is they wanted more citizen oversight. And in Muskegon, when I got here, and I just put the actual information over on the table, but we have a Citizens Police Review Board that each and every time there's a citizen's complaint, our department basically does an investigation. Well, that's just great, but that doesn't mean that anyone sees that. But in Muskegon, they do see that, because our Citizen Police Review Board gets that information and then reviews <coughs> the complaint reviews my internal investigation and also reviews what I did. And the recourse is if they don't agree or they see problems, we carry that on to another citizen above me, which is a city manager, we have a city commission, we have a mayor, and so on and so forth. So one thing I noticed, the big difference of Ferguson, according to what I read in here, is we have citizen oversight, and the departments I've worked at in the past, we've always had that. We embrace it, and I think that helps us um, understand what we're doing or not doing in the community and it's always been the guiding light for me especially as the director of public safety in Muskegon and for that we're much better and just recently 
we had a city on the east side of the state that had a questionable police shooting. This was a very affluent, a very, I think, wealthy community, lots of horsepower as far as intelligence. There's a university there, the whole nine yards. But yet they reached out to the city of Muskegon and asked us about our citizen police review board, asked us how to erect one and what our experiences are. And it just, it kind of shows me that although we have our problems in Muskegon, in a lot of areas, we're far advanced than others. And I think that's why, you know, we can sit back and continue to work on the problems that we see, the problems the community brings to us, but yet we have a lot of good things in place. If I could just follow up before we go on to uh, Mr. Blackburn. Uh, I did look at the minutes from several of those meetings, and they weren't, there weren't any minutes. Um, they met for 10 minutes and that was the end of the meeting. Is that because we don't get any complaints? Is that uh, because they're ineffective? Um, can, can you at least explain? I mean, it's good on paper, but if it's not really meeting, is it being useful? Well, you know, I think it is useful. And um, I wish I could knock on some wood around here. We, um, we have approximately 80 sworn officers, and so we're rather a large department around the state of Michigan. And uh, the department that I did my career in, we had many more citizens' complaints than we have here. Now, I'm not here to solicit any complaints against the police department, <laughs> but we do have an open um, process that people can make those complaints either to me directly coming to my office. A lot of times I ask them to, to fill out some paperwork because we need to record some things and investigate it. But um, we aren't, we do not have as many as I would anticipate um, but when we do get them, um, the, the, the panel can review that. And there's a lot of them that I write down information on those sheets that sometimes they agree with and don't agree with, but they don't have a lot of work to do. I'm not sure I want to give them a bunch of work to do, but they are there. I think they're very effective. Um, and on this sheet, this is what our panel is made up of so you understand who they are. There's three members representing the minority-based organizations. NAACP would be an example of that. Um, there's three members representing our neighborhood associations. Because the city of Muskegon, we have 14 named neighborhoods, which has really helped us with community engagement and community policing. Um, we have one law enforcement professional, but from another jurisdiction to kind of give those people some information when they may need it. And then we have two citizens that we select at large, and we don't select, the police department do, does not select these people. Our mayor and commissioner do that, and we also have another board made up of civilians that pick these people. So they're not hand-picked by the police department. They're people from the community, picked by the community. And believe me, if, if we ever have um, a serious incident, I will rely greatly on these people to give me direction um, as they review what we have done. That means the officer, our investigation, and then my disposition will be transparent and open to this Citizen Police Review Board. One last thing on that. If someone wants to file a report to the Citizen Review Board, will they go to uh, fill out a form uh, or, or ask for that review board? Or is there first an internal investigation, and then if the person doesn't like that answer, then it goes to the review board? That's correct. They can come and talk to myself or my command personally. Um, they come into our records bureau. We have the packets there. There's many different ways to, to actually um, start a complaint. And then when it's completed, I send it to a, to a um, command officer who's trained in internal investigations. When that's complete, it comes to me. I review that, and then I render my decision. If that person is not happy with that, then they can invoke or um, instigate another, um, like so, so to speak, complaint. But then the citizens police review board will look at those witness statements, look at that video, see what I've done, see what's said, and see if they think it's appropriate to, to a regular citizen on the street. Um, all right, let's uh, go on to now to uh, Mr. Blackburn. Um, what are your thoughts on the Ferguson report? And I know you're, you're not from Muskegon, but from uh, your role uh, in your job, what do you see what, that we should be learning from this? Um, 
I think the, the biggest thing that I see, and for those of you, first of all, I need to figure out the, if, because you all look so young, did your professors make you come here? I just, is this like a grade? Amen. Is that what this is? Um, I think the, the biggest thing, and, and from my perspective, uh, for those of you who don't know, MCOS is a licensing, licensing body that, that oversees every police department in the state, and we set all the standards for police departments. So um, we deal with any training of new police officers, as well as assist with the training of other officers, officers who've been on the job, or recruits, I should say, first, and then officers who've been on the job. But as far as the, the, the Ferguson issue or all the issues that are going around, the biggest thing that, that I see is, um, or if I think we can learn based on some of these findings and these reports, and is that uh, to get rid of the us versus them or the we versus them mentality, to have the mentality of um, being open and, and disclosing information. As law enforcement, you know, or it, even as myself as a former law enforcement officer, we don't necessarily, we like to keep things close to the vest. And we doing so, we keep, we keep things close to the best, but there's some things that we can disclose. And I think that if we were to disclose information that we have that is disclosable, that doesn't interfere with the investigation, it would create a better trust system with the community. So disclosure is the key to, to de-escalating situations before they get to that point. All right, thank you, thank you. Uh, Prosecutor Hilson, how about you? What, what did you learn from the Ferguson report and how does it apply to what you do in the court system? Can everybody hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? All right, good. I won't have to yell and shout. I wasn't sure how far to... Well, I mean, obviously, one of the, one of the critical things that, that I saw from the Ferguson report is that Ferguson has some things to work on. Uh, there's no question about that. Uh, and, and that's from, you know, the policing strategies to, uh, you know, they talk about the municipal courts. A lot of what they talk about in the court system, you know, is outside of, and I don't know how they're structured, but if we relate it back here to Muskegon, when we talk about what courts are going to do as far as how they're going to communicate with the citizenry, what they're going to do for fines and costs, that's, that's not my role. I don't have any control over that. That's a court administrator's role, a judge's role. Uh, th those folks set the tone for that. But, you know, what, what, I, what I was somewhat uh, pleased with in, in the fact that, you know, you, you guys are sitting or hearing from two chiefs that uh, are doing a heck of a lot to increase uh, community and police relations. Uh, and I've been here for 16 years now. So I've, sat, I've been through a couple of chiefs in the city and a couple of chiefs in the city of Muskegon Heights. And these two guys are doing a heck of a job. Uh, and it's fun to it's it's nice to partner with these organizations as it relates to you know sitting on the social justice commission with local leaders, uh, community leaders, and and pastors and and people from the community college and working on how we can better communicate and engage the community. And I think over the last year and a half, you've probably seen that I've sat on more panels and more forums with with chiefs and 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 basically listened and, and answered questions and have been willing to engage in conversation. And so I think for us in Muskegon, although, you know, folks kind of want to look at it and say, you know, we can do better, and certainly we can always do better, I think we're moving in the right direction, at least in my opinion, as it relates to engaging, uh, being, uh, engaging with the community, listening, uh, and, and engaging in practices. For example, from my standpoint, my office, um, I'm involved in a lot of different, uh, different things that don't involve sending people to jail or prison. I have my own adult and juvenile diversion program, keeping kids and, and adults out of the criminal justice system. We talk about fines and costs and whatnot. We're keeping them away from that as long as they do some community service and some other things, you know, as there's always got to be a consequence for a bad choice. Uh, being involved in programs like Project Exit, which is a brand new uh, Department of Labor grants, $2.6 million that's dealing with uh, giving men a chance to stay out of jail and stay out of prison, but educating them, giving them skills, and, and helping them and guiding them along the way so that they're not out there wandering around uh, with, with little or no knowledge. Um, I'm just trying to think of some of the other programs that I'm involved. I mean, it, it, the list kind of goes on. and so. Um, from my standpoint, Ferguson, they got work to do. Muskegon, obviously, we're going to continue to work hard at it, but we, we've been working hard at it even before this report came out. Um, just one follow-up for you. Uh, sure. Of course, I said that, and I did a couple for Director Lewis. But um, anyways, uh, one of the things they brought up that I, 
is uh, the bias within the court system. Uh -huh. And uh, I was wondering, does that raise a red flag for Muskegon in terms of bias? Um, also of, of adding court, or I'm sorry, adding charges to defendants. And um, at some point, I'd, I'd like to ask you about the uh, plea bargaining and how many uh, cases of plea bargaining actually exist. And is that encouraged? Well, there's three questions there, so yeah, which right. one do you want me to answer? <laughs> All six so, of them. How about we start with bias? <laughs> okay, bias? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I, and I, you and I had a, pri had a private conversation after the last one, and I, and, I, and I answered that quite frankly, that for me, when myself or my assistant sit down and we get a police report from an agency, I, I don't look at, okay, are they green, white, brown? I, I don't care what race they are. I really don't. What I care about is, you know, was a victim hurt? Was a crime committed? Uh, and what are we going to do about it? Is this somebody that, ha that has a, a history of issues? Is this somebody that's a first-time offender that I can put through my diversion program? Uh, those are the questions that I look at and answer. Those are the questions my assistants ask and answer. Uh, and when a case runs through the court system, we treat it like every case is treated the same. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether that person has a, a paid lawyer, doesn't matter if that person has a public defender, it doesn't matter if that person is representing themselves. Uh, what I always told folks when, I, when, I do, when I'm in court, when I always told folks, because they would always ask me, do I need a lawyer? And I always told them, if you want to hire a lawyer, have at it. But I'm telling you right now, the offer I'm making you today is the same I'm going to make to your lawyer. Uh, I, I don't treat anybody any differently. And my assistants don't treat anybody any differently. So I guess to answer your question from that standpoint, uh, I, we don't run a show where I, I look to hammer people because of where they live, uh, what they look like. Um, when uh, we started the last presentation, uh, the uh, director of the FBI quoted uh, Avenue Q, which says, no, everybody's a little bit racist. Um, is that something, you know, at least we should look at to see if uh, some of the results we're having end up being uh, harming some races more than others? If people want to look at that and they want to do a study on that, have at it. Uh, I, have, I have zero, I have nothing to hide. I don't, I, I guess, I don't agree with the FBI director uh, on that comment. Um, I've got a lot of really good friends that are African American. I, the people that commit crime, certainly I don't respect the decisions they've made, but I don't look at them as, well, you know, hey, listen, you're a, you're a black crime person, and so we're going to hammer you a little bit different than this white crime person. I mean, I've sent uh, white uh, kids that have gone to private school to prison uh, because of the actions they've done. So uh, I, I guess from my standpoint, and I can only speak for myself personally, uh, I disagree with the FBI director because uh, I don't think you can paint that broad brush because I don't think I fall into that broad brush. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Um, uh, Chief Gill. Uh, what, what did you take from the Ferguson report, uh, and how does it apply to Muskegon Heights in your role? Well, first of all, let's, let's uh, understand Muskegon Heights. Uh, we have to know of these demo demographics and know things to uh, speak of it. Um, obviously, in, uh, Muskegon Heights is uh, some 75, 80 percent African American. Um, and, and needless to say, you know, there would be uh, some concern regarding their treatment of African American. But I, I think that you really, really have to do two things. One thing, you have to start prior to the Ferguson, and I think someone said that, and, and that's what we have done. Start doing those things uh, for community-wise, community involvement, community engagement, uh, to, to prevent a, a Ferguson. And the other thing is, is being a part of, of panels and the discussions like uh, such as these to, to, to get our message out there is, is that, is that uh, one, Muskegon Heights Police Department, I've been there nearly 25 years. I worked up through the chain of command. So being the chief, I'm, people are very familiar with me and I am very familiar with them. Most of the citizens of Muskegon Heights, if not all, uh, can, know they could come to uh, Chief Gill, come to my office, and if there's a problem with it, we offer one, that's just, just that's with Chief Lewis, there is a formal complaint uh, uh, system that we use. 
and, and two, could discuss with me personally. You know, uh, a lot of the stuff things have to do is to um, communi communicate with the, with the public on, on, on a personal, the people on a personal level, you know, to get to uh, any complaints or, or what have you. And the other thing is, is that when there is a, a, a complaint of, of, of some uh, uh, um, momentum, then of course we're not going to go out and investigate our, that ourselves. We, we simply don't do that. You know, we have other agencies, Michigan State Police, uh, to, to come in and investigate those serious uh, uh, complaints. So I think with, with all of those things, you know, uh, removing the sense of, of improprieties and, and biases and, 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 and let the people see that, uh, you know, their complaints are heard. So uh, just to follow up real quick, would you say that Ferguson and other places that have been in the news, uh, they, one of the problems was that they, uh, they, they did their own internal investigations? No, with Ferguson, what I'm saying about Ferguson is that it didn't happen with the one incident. It's been a, a, a pot just boil, waiting to boil over, and that is the, was, the, was the one that boiled it completely over. So uh, the, the Ferguson, and, and of course, you know, I don't like, don't like speaking for another agency, but they probably should have instituted some of these things some time ago. Okay, thanks. Can, can I just sure, excuse sure. you just for a second? Um, I think, it, and I like to take the gloves off and just be real. I, I, it, it's interesting that you speak about this complaint system and, you know, being, getting this from two perspectives, a former law enforcement officer being an African-American male. I talk to young people all the time. And the problem is that young people don't, if they feel they're mistreated, you know, I, I hear these policies and I respect these, these gentlemen for having them and being in law enforcement, but the real, reality is a lot of times people don't complain when they get bad service because they feel like what? Nothing's mm -hmm. gonna be done. And they're afraid to do it if they go in because they feel like they'll be targeted, especially in communities where they're known. So, you know, I think we can implement some other systems like maybe having something online maybe having a complaint system online where they don't have to come in and speak to the uh, a sergeant that's on duty and they don't have to feel like they'll be uh, 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 you know, singled out or ostracized or targeted by the police in those situations. The, these processes are here and I commend these gentlemen because the processes are in place and there are some agencies that don't have processes. But in, in order for them to work, we need to make sure that, that people feel comfortable with doing them. Sorry, Andy. Um, no, no, I, I have to. Speaking of, of the, the head, I've got to. Uh, my boss says he wants to talk, so I'll let him. <laughs> Sorry, Andy. See, I called you. You know, I try to say all of these things because we have very competent people who are capable of doing just an excellent job here. But I, but uh, for the, I'll say the young man's point. I'm 60 years old. That's the second time I've been called young today, man. I can call somebody. I'm old enough to call somebody young, so I love it. But, but in, in, in a past life, I worked with the Boston Police Department. I was the research director there, the technology director, and we did exactly what you're discussing. In 1990, we, we knew our our agency was under a consent decree uh, for both hiring bias and and um, and implementation bias. And so the way that we felt that we could uh, remove that bias was to move, bring technology into the equation. And again, this is 1990, this is a long time ago. Most of you students, you guys are so young, you weren't even born then, right? <laughs> I, 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 no, see, I, I, I know they, were they born weren't. Then. But we were working on those kinds of issues then to, to, to clear the kinds of bias away that we knew that was uh, being meted out for, for decades and, or, or centuries, really. And it, it was working at that time. And I, I, I'll, I'll stop there, but that, to me, technology is the way that you can remove some of the bias that, that still exists in, in not just police agencies and colleges and universities for that matter. But thanks, Andy. Thanks, Dr. Weibold. <laughs> Thank you, President Nesbitt. <laughs> all right. Um, all right, how about uh, Nicholas Budimir? What do you think uh, about Ferguson? What can you take from this? And, I guess also the discussion we've already had. Well, Andy, I mean, the report came out, and the report found systematic bias throughout the Ferguson Police Department, um, a money-seeking policy of ticket issuing, and a systematic uh, violation of First Amendment 
Fourth Amendment and Fourteenth Amendment rights. Then I did some extra research. Aha. Uh -huh. And you, uh, not U.S. News and World Report, but um, uh, a trashy newspaper called USA Today did a wonderful study. And you know what they found? They found 1,581 departments that have worse racially biased arrest rates than Ferguson. I will give you a few examples. So, so uh, you know, we're, we're highlighting Ferguson, but my point is that uh, racially biased policing or racially biased arrest rates, imprison imprisonment rates, and incarceration rates are not uh, limited to uh, uh, a mid-sized city on the, on the Mississippi River, or is it Missouri? Uh, well, in Missouri, um, it's sort of across the nation. Let me give you a few examples. I looked into it, and the city of Muskegon has approximately, the arrest rate of uh, blacks is about 2.3 times in 2011-2012 that of the rate of non-blacks. In Muskegon Heights, it's 1.8 times the rate of non-blacks. So you say, oh my god, that's huge. Uh, but we can say, we can let um, Chief Gill and Chief Lewis a little bit off the hook, uh, just a little bit, because <laughs> actually that's not bad compared to our good friends in Norton Shores that arrest blacks at seven times the rate uh, that non-blacks are arrested. So I looked into it more. My own hometown, Dearborn, Michigan, which has probably the worst racial history m maybe in the country because of our mayor, because of our uh, right, overt racial policy, overt, overt racist policies well into the 1980s. Uh, Dearborn, with a African-American population of 4%, arrests blacks at 26 times the rate of non-blacks. I also looked it up right across the lake here, right across Lake Michigan from us in, where the heck was it? What the heck was it? Watawaka. No, Wauwatosa, Wisconsin. Anyone been to Wauwatosa? I was just there. You were just there. <laughs> blacks are arrested at 30 <laughs> times the rate Don't of non-blacks. So uh, USA Today found 1,500 uh, police departments that arrest blacks at a higher rate than Ferguson. Um, I mean, my point is we're scratching the surface of a systematic institutional practice that is maybe not even the result of individual bias, but could actually still result in racist bias and a harm to African Americans, Latinos, and Native Americans, even if you do, even if you do not have individual discriminators. So we have a system, um, right, uh, um, Prosecutor Hilson uh, said, we treat everybody equally, yes, but everybody does not have the same ability to defend themselves, the same resources with which to sustain appeal after appeal after appeal, and under the threat of, well, this is your second offense, you're from a, a, a poor neighborhood, this is the best you can get. So we, I mean, we, my point always is we have a gigantic system that you can you can be you can be a non-racist, uh, and the system, how the laws, how wealth is distributed, how income is distributed, how uh, segregation has uh, affected our housing policies, how uh, uh, poor communities are beset by higher crime rates. Uh, the effect will be what we call racist or racial effects. So the, the Ferguson report highlighted it. Uh, the, the sad killing of Michael Brown, the sad killing of 12-year-old uh, uh, Tam uh, Tamir Rice, the sad killing of Walter Scott. These sparks highlight 
um, a sort of bigger problem that uh, um, Chief Gill has sort of mentioned bubbling, bubbling was your, uh, bubbling under the surface, which is systematic racial inequality due to the system, not due to the fault of, of racial minorities themselves. That has never been addressed, even since the Civil Rights Movement, and I would hope uh, the Ferguson Report would be one of these steps in which the country can move forward to a point where we can uh, consciously address these, um, basically, I've said it again, sorry, systematic biases. So. And so how, how, how do you go about doing that? I mean, first, this is, you're saying, making us aware of the racial bias we have. Because um, we're, we're in an era in which we systematically deny it. Barack Obama's the president, so there's no racism, except there's 2.3 million people in jail, prison, jail, prison, sta uh, state prisons, and jails, and 42% of all of them are African American, and only 13% of the general population are African American. So African Americans are being imprisoned at nearly five times the rate of others, and that has detrimental, del deleterious economic, social, and cultural f effects on one community and not others. It also hurts poor whites as well, does not hurt the white middle class, certainly doesn't hurt, and probably helps the white upper class. Um. Thank you, um, and, and uh, I, I, I want to ask uh, Chief Gill, um, since as, as you mentioned, uh, Muskegon Heights is predominantly African American, um, these statistics that uh, Nicholas brings up, or Mr. Budimir, that um, they affect your community, I, I suspect, greatly. Um, just to add to it or support it, um, one in 12 black men are behind bars compared to one in 60 for the rest of the population. Um, New York Times just reported that um, one in six black men have disappeared from daily life due to uh, being in prison or not alive. Uh, that's about 1.5 million do uh, people. And, and, and as a result, when people get out of prison, uh, they don't have a lot of choices in life uh, given uh, their arrest record. Um, how does that affect your community? You know, when this, um, when this uh, Ferguson report first came out, uh, it was it was a bombshell, and I'm um, I'm believing that there's not one chief of police or one department head that looked at that and thought in their mind, what about us? What about this department? How we uh, let let's look at our processes and see are they or they address some some type of systematic uh, <coughs> excuse me address some type of systematic biases in our processes, and we all have looked at it. We and you have to look at it. you have to look at it on a, on a continuous on, on a continuous basis. You know, um, a lot of um, police processes uh, they, they they date back to 1950s, 1960s, 1970s. But not the seventies is not old, but <laughs> <laughs> matter of opinion, <laughs> they're right around the corner. Yeah. Careful, man. But, but they date back, uh, you know, uh, uh, during the early part of the, uh, the in the, the infancy or, or middle of, of of policing, you know, when, when it was being put together. So uh, yes, uh, Jeff uh, Ferguson made us look at that and say. Okay, are we are we doing anything to make make a system? Are we making systematic errors here? Are we being uh, biased systematic on a systematic scale? And, and did you find anything yet, or are you still doing the, the look? No, I am. Uh, since I've been chief of police, uh, I've, I've I've worked on not only uh, city ordinances uh, for the city of Muskegon Heights, but have really went to uh, what we call Michigan Municipal League uh, and 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 looked at. What they have as far as policies and have emulated that and made it our own to make sure that, that we are, are not systematically, uh, unfairly targeting or biasing people. You know, um, you, you police officers, and I'm going to, I think we all need to be said, police officers are people. They were people before they put the badge on. Uh, it's the job of the administrator, the chief of police. To, to monitor these people, to, to make sure 
that, that, that in, in the best way they can, that, 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 that this person, this officer, is not out there uh, harming the public that he's supposed to be protecting. Okay. Chief Lewis, or Director Lewis? Yeah, as I hear some of the comments come out, you know, I want the audience to understand a couple things. As we hear things come from around the country, I want you to understand it's not always the same every place. And one thing in the Ferguson report I talked about it says the city's practices are shaped by revenue rather than public safety needs, okay? In Michigan, we're not set up that way. When we get fees or fines, they go to a court system, the city gets a very small percentage of that back. It doesn't even hardly do anything for my department as far as revenue goes. It's not, in my scheme of the budget, it doesn't even have any kind of impact whatsoever. Those monies are dispersed by the court for different things. Um, even through the years, I'm not sure where it all goes. I've heard library fund, all kinds of things. But the point is, it doesn't come to the police department, okay? I started in 1978 as a full-time officer. Probably a lot of you were born before that, correct? <laughs> all right. So what I've, what I've seen is this constantly, and Chief Guild has talked about this, the constantly evolving methods and practices that we do in law enforcement, because what I'm doing today, which I think is prudent and non-biased, in five years from now, could be viewed as biased policing. And I remember through the years when we would get trained by the federal government get trained by state agencies on drug interdiction, profiling, and different things. They were police practices. When I look back at those sometimes, I'm thinking, hey, those could have been biased practices, but we were trained that. And after a while of utilizing those things, we look back and went, you know, we don't want to do that. And we're at another stage now. And then now we're in Muskegon. And one thing I want to uh, springboard off what the prosecutor said is we sit as a group we have a social justice committee that's african-american uh, pastors from the faith-based faith -based community we have college you know college employees sitting on that prosecutor's office law enforcement forgive me because i'm probably forgetting different disciplines that sit on there but one thing that we did is we we saw the youth in our truancy and you know they're truant they're not going to school how are we going to handle that and I think DJ can talk about what we've done in this county about truancy. But something that excited me is, is curfew. Kids staying out too late, because you know they get involved in crime, bad things happen, drugs, drinking, you name it, negative police contacts, because they're past curfew. So we came up with what we call, um, we used to call it a curfew enforcement. That sound kind of mean? Curfew sting. You know, like we're gonna, you know, we're gonna sting these little kids, you know? <laughs> we came up with a curfew intervention. And when we found children past the hour, they were either brought into the police department and then, or maybe a church or another community center, and we were reconnecting the parent and the child. The prosecutor's office was with us. We invited the faith-based organizations to come with us. This is going on with a goal, more of a reward program, to get them reconnected back into activities and those kind of things. So that's something we would have never done 20 years ago. That's where we're now. And we think we've had success. We think it's helped kids. We think they won't wind up in jail or prison because hopefully we're reconnecting them back with positive activities which lead to better education. They're playing a sport, whatever, and they become a productive young adult and then on. So I want, I don't, when I have these forums and I hear kind of what I call negative information. I want the audience to always understand there's two sides that we're really doing a lot um, besides for a lot of the negative um, statistics that come out that we're very aware of. We, we know we're good at putting people in jail. We're, we're fully aware of that. The jails are full. We're building a new one. You know, is, is that a success story? We don't think so. Our prisons are full. Do we think that's a success story? We don't think so. We've talked about felony forgiveness and a bunch of stuff. And that's law enforcement talking about that. Because we don't think our efforts have been that successful in helping people not return to crime. Um, just to follow up on that, I, mean, I do appreciate you bringing out some of the positive things that uh, all the people on the panel are well-meaning people who do a lot of good work. And, and uh, the community does uh, 
uh, respect and appreciate all that. Um, but I, I do want, want to point out uh, one thing. Uh, you, you mentioned when, the year, was it 76 you started? No, no it was 78. 78, sorry. To, okay. I was born in 76. Move it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, as Mr. Budim Budimir mentioned, um, um, we have a lot more people in jail than we used to. And you mentioned we don't want to put more and more people in jail. In uh, 1972, there were 300,000 people in the United States in jail. Now there's between 2.2 and 2.3 million people. Um, that is, is, are we, is that better for society that we have more people in prison? Or were we better in 72 or maybe 78? No, but, I, I, but there again, I, sometimes I think that comes from society. I see it in law enforcement where people demand that we go out and we have created a lot of new crimes people can, can commit. We then go out and effect arrests, and a lot of people, I've sat in the courtroom, we've offered a plea deal to let someone out or to pay a fine, and the citizens, the victims, the citizens have demanded they go to jail. They want them in jail. A lot of times, you know, when I sit in court, it doesn't matter to me what the sentence is. It doesn't matter to me if they get convicted or not. I'm there to, to present the facts because it disturbs me when I see, like this morning, a, ge a gentleman served 30, he's the longest serving ever, 39 years in jail or whatever it was, 36 years, uh, for a crime that he did not commit because now modern technology, his DNA did not match and he was released. That bothers me. So I, I want everyone to know, Police officers do not find any satisfaction in people going to jail. Matter of fact, we would, we work harder when we have to do that. And so we would prefer that, you know, whatever we can do to work something out, we don't always think the jail is the answer. And sometimes these registries we're doing, um, all this information is out there. The citizens really fear felons. They really fear they see somebody went to prison. They really fear a sex offender that's on a list, and they don't even know why they're on there. And I've seen people on that list that shouldn't even be on there, but they're there, and now they're labeled, which means they can't get a job. You know, they're like, you know, they'll return to crime, and it recidivates over and over again. Um, and I always tell people, when when our society will not accept these people back, or doesn't have felony forgiveness, you know where these people wind up. They wind up in your home. And what I mean by that, they're working at Home Depot putting a floor in your house when you're at work. They're, they're painting. They become a handy person. They take jobs and they're right in your house when you're not working because they're not working for the city where we could supervise them and watch them. They take other jobs in construction and those things. And they're around you. You just don't know it. That's where they're at. All right, thanks. Um, Andy, yeah, quickly. You, I mean, uh, this is wonderful uh, that um, Chief Lewis brings this up, and I think everybody kind of knows, knows it, and Chief Lewis sort of alluded to this idea that society, right, so the, the political system, especially you guys know, in the 1980s, right, so maybe it was people, maybe it was the political system started to demand tougher penalties. Three strikes and you're out laws. Two strikes and you're out laws in South Carolina and in Georgia. The uh, widening and the uh, lengthening and create, uh, of prison sentences, especially for drugs, even if it's a nonviolent offense, the tacking on of 25 years for a third, um, e even if it's a high misdemeanor. Uh, vastly expanding our prison population. So I, I, I definitely like what Chief Lewis is saying. Um, to some extent, the criminal justice system, uh, cops, courts, it's, uh, cops, courts, uh, prisons, have to respond to what politicians. Now let's touch on that for a second. So conservative politicians and some of those blue dog Democrats in the 80s, even people like Bill, like Bill Clinton um, made a lot of political traction saying 
Uh, we got to get tough on crime. We got to get tough on drugs. Remember all those stupid drug commercials with the eggs? Drugs are not eggs, people. Um, right, right, your brain frying. I mean, we had a systematic misinformation campaign about including marijuana. Half the country now doesn't believe any of that, but our laws are still biasedly. Um, uh, uh, and, and they kind of, uh, biased against uh, poor communities, against African American communities, and uh, I, sadly, right, in a, let's just say, let's take any bias in, in police and prosecutors out, they still have to enforce the mm -hmm. anti poor laws that we passed in the 80s and 90s. They have to enforce those anti-vagrancy, meaning anti-poor laws that people like Rudy Giuliani passed in New York, right? T take the homeless people out and drive, drop them off at the city. My students even told me that uh, Norton Shores has a uh, um, law like that, drop the, drop, uh, give, the uh, give homeless people a ticket to Grand Rapids. So, um, I, mean, we, I, I mean, one of the big issues is we have to uh, address the, you know, what are we defining as crime? I, uh, Chief Lewis um, or DJ or somebody uh, said we had new crimes that we came, we did come, come up with new crimes. Now it's time for a new decriminalization um, so at, on a, at a societal level, we need I, to do I, that. On a societal, I'm not saying there isn't, there aren't, there aren't some, some some major problems in policing, but I do want to, I, I want to say, l let's not all say, you know, black inequality or Native American inequality is the result of the police. It's not. But is there a little bit? Y yeah. Yes, it is a little so, bit. But Pro Prosecutor I mean, Nelson, if I could uh, have you kind of respond. I mean, uh, do you feel pressure to, uh, from society, you think, uh, to, to uh, you know, be hard on crime or make sure people get longer sentences? And uh, I mean, there, well, let there me, are let some... Me ask, let me ask you this, Andy. Yeah. I, and I'm, I'm not doing this to be silly, but, uh, you know, if somebody came up to you after this forum, you're walking in the parking lot, and stuffed a gun in your face Thanks. and said, give me your wallet. Uh, do you want me to be soft on that Absolutely. person or do you want Absolutely. me to kind of throw the book at him? Absolutely. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not thank Amish. Thank I, I wouldn't say do nothing, <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> no, I'm, but, and I'm not being silly, silly about it, but... But I, 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 you gotta, I would say I'm, I'm kind of... I would like to see that, that person improve in life and not... Sure. Uh, but but also not be a threat to society. I, I agree. Yeah. And, and so you represent about... 80 people I see every month, all right? My job is to make sure that when victim, when people are victimized by crime, by criminals, and they come and they say, Mr. Hilson, this is what we want. And I, I'll tell you, it runs the spectrum. I've got people that say, you know what? It's a one-time deal. We don't really want to see a whole lot happen to this person. And we go, great. We will, we will do what we can to accommodate you. I've got the other extreme. This really affected our lives. Our home was violated. Our security is violated. My kids don't feel safe anymore. Throw the book at them. Fine, we'll throw the book at them. So you can't overgeneralize this topic because I, I appreciate you guys as professors and the work that you do, but you don't sit in my chair. I, I'm don't. sure it's a hard job. It yeah. is. It's very difficult. And I try to accommodate as many people as I can. And that includes even people that uh, maybe don't deserve being accommodated. I, I see myself as a very reasonable individual. Uh, and, and I guess just to, I, I, I can't let, and I love Nick because he, he is. <laughs> you, no, 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 let's be, <laughs> let's be, let's be enemies here. <laughs> yeah, enemies I, I love him, I do. I think he's a great guy. But you, you know, when we talk about the system, you, you guys have to understand where the system was, even before I was a prosecutor, to where we are now. Not too long ago, 25, 30 years ago, there were no sentencing guidelines in the state of Michigan. Mm -hmm. So judges were allowed to sentence however they chose as long as it was within two-thirds of the statutory max. Okay, so for instance, a person who was convicted of possession of cocaine automatically is doing two years in prison. Fast forward to today. You have to have a criminal record about as long as this room to go to prison on possession of cocaine. Okay, then that's the result of the legislators legislator in, over the years crafting these sentencing guidelines 
and basically telling courts, okay, here's what you're going to take into consideration. Here's the range you have, and you have to stay within this range. If you go outside this range, you better show substantial and compelling reasons that you're going outside of this range. Otherwise, you know, the state, the appellate courts are going to knock it back and you're going to have to resentence this individual. We used to have mandatory minimums here in the state of Michigan when it came to drug laws. A uh, very effective tool for those that work narcotics when we're trying to get the not, the, not the mules, not the people running drugs here and there, but we're trying to get the actual distributors, the dealers. Very useful tools to get to that level. Back in 2006, I think it was, 2007, Six or seven. Yeah. state got rid of them, okay? Law enforcement, a little upset by that, but you know what? We worked within the system. Mm -hmm. uh, we understood why they did it. I didn't appreciate it, but understood it, and we worked within the system. So this idea that, you know, we, that for some reason where society is driving this, uh, maybe to an extent, but I, I, can, I can tell you this, that there has been a lot of the society that you guys are subscribing to that has had some influence in how the criminal justice system has changed. I can tell you right now uh, that uh, last year, before lame duck, there were two very important bills that were coming through as it related to probation and parole. I, I worked on that behind the scenes. I represent the Prosecuting Attorneys Association, sitting at the table with all the stakeholders, all right? We worked very hard to try and accommodate what, what was trying to happen. They didn't pass. I now have been appointed to sit on the Criminal Justice Policy Commission, the Governor's Criminal Justice Policy Commission. So this discussion, these discussions are going to continue for many years to come. Uh, you know, and it's all about, you know, the bottom line. How do we decrease uh, the budget for Michigan when it comes to Department of Corrections? Um, and, and, and that's, that's going to be tough, I'm sure. It for, is. For, for you and, and for uh, other parts of the system. Because I'm thinking about guys that have guns stuck in their face. Yeah, right, right. But, but also, I mean, I, I mean you, you can give a story like that uh, to pretty much shut me up. But we do have a lot of people in jail that we didn't. And, um, Actually, Michigan's prison population has decreased over the years. Well, uh, just one. Yeah. Well, actually, actually, again, not, not to nominate the conversation, but in, in 1983, I was uh, the Senate Fiscal Analyst for the Michigan Department of Corrections. In 1983, if I said 73, um, the, the rated capacity of the system was 13,067. You look it up. Today it is, what, 44, 45,000. Yep. So it has, DJ, you're right, it has decreased from about 60,000. Um, in the last 15 years, but it's up dramatically over time. And, and, that, and that single issue was what drove me to do my doctoral work. So I want to make sure that, and I have to leave in about five minutes, that's why I'm sort of grabbing the mic again. <laughs> but, um, um, well, we, it, we could, Dr. Nesbury, we could get in a discussion probably yeah. for the rest of the night about where prison cost really is. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And, that, I, and I agree with you fundamentally in terms of the direction that we're going now. So I, I don't want to make, um, make that that mistake, but I, I wanted to point that out because it, it, it's a different story than it used to be 40 years ago. Thank you for that comment, being here. Um, uh, um, go ahead, uh, Mr. Black. You know, it, it's, it's interesting. You asked a, a specific question, and um, to go back to the systematic bias that Nick was speaking of, um, you know, I, I don't know how you can fix, fix a systematic bias. I don't know how you can fix implicit bias. You can't fix bias. All you can do is try to adjust a bias. Um, you know, let me answer the question directly. If, if you know, at least help to try to answer it. Um, if we feel that, that police departments are, are racially biased or uh, are unfair or, or however, um, and, and it's interesting because I see this from two, two perspectives. I was a former law enforcement officer. I still work in law enforcement, not as a sworn police officer, but I'm also, I happen to be a black man. <laughs> um, so I, I've seen both sides of this coin. Um, with this being said, you know, I think we can talk about all these, these, these statistics. We can talk about things all day. But in terms of how we try to influence or direct the issue or the challenge, if we feel departments are so racist, uh, why don't we integrate or infiltrate them? You know, I love what, what the president said. He said from the very beginning that we need to be the change. 
We need, and that's something that I push all over the place. We need good officers. Mm -hmm. We need good officers. We need officers that look like the communities they serve. Mm -hmm. We do. And I'll tell you this, I, I oversee all the police departments in the state. Chiefs call me all the time because they cannot find good officers, not because they have criminal records, not because they're all, all, all drug addicts or drug dealers, minority officers or minorities in that vein. It's because you all don't want to do this job. It's particularly, I'll say the minorities don't want to do this job. We are an anomaly. This does not happen in most places. Uh, and I'm telling you this, and that's Why do you where the problem is. Because, with the, because of statements like these, and I, I'm not picking on Nick, but we speak about these, these, these statistics that are factual statistics. But think about this: the statistic he brought up about uh, uh, um, Muskegon Heights. Of course, there are going to be more black people arrested because it's but, a predominantly but that, black city. But that was the <laughs> lowest one. But none, that was the none, lowest one. Nonetheless, that's going to happen. But when we perpetuate this, the problem is that you are in here. If we need you, we need everyone that is in here to fight. If you don't want to be a police officer, get a hold of your family, your friends, your sisters, your brothers, your, your minorities, your Latinos, your, uh, the Arabic people. We need you. And that's what the problem, therein lies the problem for me, is that we go through forums like this all the time, and the people who should be fixing the problem do nothing but this. So I, I throw it back on you guys, you know, for, for that purpose. So it is a huge challenge. We do, I'm not telling you that, I, I got to disagree with my friend here, Jeff, <laughs> who is, cops do like arresting bad guys. We do. I liked it. I loved it. You do something wrong, I'm going to arrest you and put you in jail. That's my job. That is my job. I, I worked narcotics for two years. I loved it. I bought and sold dope for a living. I loved it because I arrested bad guys because my father died from a drug overdose. That's what we do. So that, that is our job. And so we need people who are willing to not just talk about it, but come in and make the change and be a part of the change and the solution. Uh, I, mean, I, I think uh, that's good. Um, you're liking it, though. I mean, are we... Does that mean we attract the right type of police officers that like to do that? Or should we try uh, changing the way police departments are in place to say, hey, I don't want to do this. Sometimes I have to do it. I mean, I don't like giving bad grades to students, but, but sometimes they, I have to. I know some of you think I do. Yeah, who yes, he does. Uh, yes, he does. <laughs> Here's my question, Andy. Who earned that grade? Yeah. Did, you, did, you, did you give them the bad grade because you wanted to give it to them, or did they earn it? That's part of the challenge here. And I, do but, we, but I don't feel good about it. You know? and, and I, I can't you know imagine what? feeling good arresting I feel somebody. good about somebody that sticks a gun to your head and me arresting them. I feel good about it because I get to your house and I can say, I arrested that guy that did this to your family. So that, that's the point. Now let's say this. Okay. Do we need to reinvent ourselves in law enforcement? Absolutely. Do we need to change some things? Absolutely. We need to start recruiting in the elementary school level, minority students, good people, period. We got to do it. And we got to change it. We need you all to help us with those things. Not to put a wall or forge this gap between us, but to assist us so that we can make the departments better departments for everybody and the city's better for everyone to live in. All right, Andy, let me jump in here. I all right, forgot right. to right now, this is really yeah. important. Sternell just joggles something. In Michigan, we want our department to look like our community. Since the day I've got here on our hiring process, and we have openings right now, we try to hire qualified candidates. We look for minorities. I have asked where they're at. The, the supply is not there. The demand is high. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. Do you, Here's an do you example agree right with here. that, Chief Gill? Do you have that issue? Absolutely. Hold on. Absolutely. I, I want to yes. finish. Okay, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. So here's Darnell right here. Sharp young man, went in law enforcement. Young three times. Not that demand. He was taken away into a, you know, now he worked, he left law enforcement because when I was at Slay, I'd recruit great minority candidates. The next thing I know, here comes the state police grabbing them. FBI, M. Coles could not keep them at our local police department because they were sharp individuals and they're like anybody else. They're pursuing their career dreams and they're out the door. 
One more thing, Andy, and I'll shut up here. Um, <laughs> I heard you got salt in the parking lot. <laughs> yeah, but it was another professor. But guess what? We don't just match up a person of you know of color to his crime, just to just to make that arrest. You are going to tell us what this person looked like, this criminal looked like, mm -hmm. and then we will be like, right now we'll be happy to go get him. <laughs> but the point is, we don't usually pick the offenders, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. The citizens give us information. Who did this retail fraud? Who put the gun in Andy's face? That's how we operate the vast majority of time. And I even worked on studies on driving while black. We went to intersections, and we had autos in the car with us. And we were trying to stop cars that African Americans are driving. And one thing that we knew, and the autos started learning, it's hard to see who the driver is all the time. And so sometimes we make the stop based on, we have to have a pretext stop, like you're speeding or something like that. We didn't know a lot of times who the driver was until we got up there. You know what I mean? Not to say there was an officer out there just trying to stop minorities, but even the owners went, man, it's, it's kind of hard to see who's driving the car. So I just want to get that up. Um, and Darnell should come back to law enforcement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, do you, do you agree with that? I mean, are, do you yeah. feel like your department's representative yeah. of the community? Um, we, the, the reason why we are where we are now is, is, is because uh, when I first hired uh, on at Muskegon High School Department, we were 36 sworn officers, and uh, the department was at 80% uh, or more African American. And, and through, uh, through retirements and, and those type deals, you know, you, 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 you turn over, officers turn over. And as time progressed, uh, I know well, I can speak for the last five years when I've been the chief. <laughs> I've hired one African American. I want Muskegon Heights to reflect the community. But, I, but, but I've hired at least 10, uh, 12, 15 officers. One was African American, one was Hispanic. And I think one is uh, Korean. That's it. Um, I, w I want to open this up to the crowd. I'm sure Weibel, can I respond really, really quick? I have two really quick right. points uh, right, that will turn quick. to seven points after your own style. Um, uh, as, as a very intelligent uh, uh, student of mine, a criminal justice major, mentioned to me after our last uh, uh, forum, um, I, I heard it, a similar uh, argument from uh, uh, from Chief Lewis uh, that you know, we respond to calls, basically. And a very intelligent student of mine said, yes, Mr. Budimir, but there's a lot of discretion within each call, within each call, how do you treat a person, right? Do we hear, um, you know, shooting on, I'm, I'm from Grand Rapids, so uh, shooting on Sherman, do we come up with six cars? Or, you know, shooting on, I don't, you know, maybe somewhere in North Muskegon, whatever, uh, you know, we just roll up easy. Uh, so there's a lot of discretion in how somebody responds that's to a call. That's, 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 that's not true. That's not true. Okay. Completely untrue. That's not how it works. It, it's, I'm sorry. Okay. It doesn't. Oh. I'm familiar with that. I'll take care of that myself. I, I, you only won't do that with a man with a gun yeah. or some type of felony yeah. assault. You know, that yeah. don't happen. I'm sorry. Well, okay, second point. I could be wrong. I, uh, not, a, not a cop. I was, I was told by somebody. Detroit did it. Not saying it's not very difficult. I'm not saying that the, that the uh, supply argument isn't true. Detroit Police Department has 61% African American officers. And uh, according to the Detroit News, how Detroit did it was first, they had a very progressive black mayor, Mayor Coleman Young, and he systematically made it his political, there's politics again, political goal to change the racial makeup of Detroit Police Department. And they did it with enormous difficulty, resistance from uh, old officers who said, this is what the Detroit News said. One officer said, gave in here, you know, old, old officer, sit there, be quiet, let me do my job, and you stay there, and you be black. One number, right? 1970. Officer, so. 
1970, yeah, oh. at the turn at the turn of Vietnam, where everybody was was getting out. It's a completely different. You can't use that statistic. No, it's 61 percent today. In, in, because that, today. That's still, and now they struggle with finding minorities. I have worked. Detroit is I'm one sure. of the police departments I oversee. They struggle with recruiting minorities I, that, I as, believe, as I every other place in it. the country. It's 61 percent because that's still what's left over. But through attrition, all oh, that's mm. going to change because they're having the same problems that everyone else is having. So that's it. You know, in today's statistic about Detroit, if you talk to the prominent African-American leaders of that city, you know what they'll tell you? There's not enough diversity in that city. Do you know that? That's what I'll tell you uh, now. I, today. I, be I believe, I mean, the, the, the leaders of Detroit didn't want it to be uh, the, the premier white flight city but it, I mean, I got a, you know, I grew up in Dearborn. <laughs> Us white folks messed it up. We left, we took our money, we took industry, uh, and we took the housing prices. So, I mean, I, I certainly don't want to blame uh, cities that were the victims of, uh, uh, of economic forces. Muskegon, Muskegon lost 16 factories. There used to be 21 factories here. There's two, basically two. So, I mean, I do want us to see you know, I don't, I'm not victimizing uh, our fellows in law enforcement, but, um, you know, they're kind of like foot soldiers of a big system and the, you know, the systematic violence of the economy, the systematic violence of um, uh, African-American males who uh, uh, can't find jobs because of first, fire, first hired, la uh, last hired, first fired, um, but it's, it's, it, you know, it is part of the system. So okay. I'll let you go, Andy. All right, I, I want to open this up to you. Um, so raise your hands and I'll, I'll go in order. Um, and uh, I don't know what order that is, actually. But I'll, I'll go with people that I see. Um, and uh, again, please try to keep your questions short and uh, to the point. And that would be greatly appreciated. I'll start over here. Hello, my name is Rachel. Um, I, I know that I babysit a lot and I hear these parents talk to their kids and they're always threatening to call the police on them if they're naughty. Man. But do you think Terrible. that maybe you'd have better so, um, luck recruiting if we could get parents to stop doing that somehow? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, make them stop, yes. <laughs> it's embarrassing when they come up and want us to right. arrest you're them. Absolutely. Um, but the, that, 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 let's go back to this social, this systematic issue. If we go back, you're absolutely right. Think about this. When a firefighter shows up, what is a firefighter gonna do? They're going to put the fire out. They're going to rescue you. They're going to save your cat. When a police officer shows up, Johnny, little three-year-old Johnny, you're going to go to jail. If you don't see this police, see this tiny bat, he's going to take you to jail. This is a part of the whole systematic problem that is perpetuated you, throughout society. Do you think that's why this uh, video that came out with the police officers playing uh, football with the, pl with the students was so popular that... that uh, <laughs> well, it, it was so popular it's because people wanted to see good... I mean, uh, we, we want to put that out, police. but we do that all the time, man. That's not something I know, that but, but is that why it was popular? It's because of all this going on? Yeah, I yeah. think it was so spontaneous. And I, you know, when I first saw it, I went, I just sat there for a second, trying to say which way I was going to go. <laughs> and then it just started pouring in the support. And, um, you know, if I'd have known that, I'd have bought, we had 20 patrol cars, I'd have bought 19 other footballs. <laughs> and we'd have them out in the community and started playing exactly. football. No, but that was so spontaneous. <laughs> and it shows you what the officers were caught you know, just how they interact in the community. It happens much more frequently than one would think. Not all the time, but it surprised me, and the community really liked it. Yes, they sure did. They sure did. Uh, another question. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that's um, a problem isn't just the police officers and how many people they arrest. It's when they do make these grotesque mistakes, you know, like shooting somebody 14 times. You don't shoot somebody 14 times to try to stop them from coming at you. Shoot someone 14 times to make them dead, dead. You don't go past, go or collect $200, you're dead. <laughs> when cops make such grotesque mistakes, it seems like part of the problem is why aren't more of them then being charged and being prosecuted? Why isn't there a three strikes and you're out for cops? I can address that. 
I can address that. Actually, what, what's <laughs> happening, and I'll tell you guys specifically now, MCO, again, we're the licensing body. We take officer's licenses away. Right now, the only thing that we can take an officer's license away at MCOs, where the certification board is for be, them being convicted of a felony. That's because your legislature has not given us the authority to do so. Chiefs may think that, people think that we're fighting right now for that legislation, that if you commit an assault of crime, a drug crime, because here's what happens. You know how hard, he'll tell you, how, how often do felonies actually get convicted of felonies, even an officer? What happens is they get convicted of a misdemeanor, they plead to a misdemeanor, then they're charged with a felony, and then what they do is they go to another department that is not as squared away as these two great departments, and they get hired, and they start working at this agency, and then they commit, the, they commit a crime or they do something egregious. So it's not, it's not that we don't want to, it's that we don't have the statutory authority, and we're fighting for that right now to answer your question. Uh, let me just follow up with that question. Uh, Inkster recently had this uh, terrible That's beating. That's what I'm talking about. Right? That's and about and I, I noticed in the video I saw, there were lots of police officers there watching it go on. I mean, more and more arrived as time went on while the beating was still happening. Uh, but they were not the ones who uh, turned this uh, case in. It was being... It was uh, made public, the video camera, and, th and that's what turned this into a big deal. Do police officers uh, have a whistleblowing uh, approach, or, or are they, in, or is it, uh, oh, is, are people reluctant to turn their fellow police officers in when they see crimes committed? Am I, am I answering? Because I would. I, I don't know. <laughs> if, if, whoever I don't wants want to hog the mic. I've been yeah. killing it already. But I, if, <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm, I'm rapping up here. <laughs> I get it. We, we've all heard about <laughs> the, the the blue blue wall of silence right. and uh, administrators, uh, police chiefs. Uh, we have, we deal with that all the time. Believe it or not, on our books and our policy and procedure, we have policy that says that if you observe an officer. Uh, acting or doing something inappropriate or, or breaking the law, what have you, you have turned them in because if you don't, then we're going to get you. Mm -hmm. So uh, we use every method, but when they're out in the field, you got Officer Smokes and Officer Joe. Mm -hmm. There's two of them out there, so there's two of them that's going to see this impropriety. So, yes, we want our uh, officers to, 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 to do so, but they do work together. And that is uh, and and that, so that's part of the yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, it's just, just, to, just to follow up, it's just the same as what we deal with with the regular investigations. I mean, just as though the officers are just like we said, they're people. They're people. Uh, and, and what we've seen in Muskegon in particular is that when something happens, people act the same way. They either don't talk or they lie when they, when they want to, you know, to protect whomever, whether it be their friends, their relatives, or whoever. So, again, they're not superhuman. They're, they're individuals. They're humans, just like everybody else. Uh, does it make it right? No, but it is certainly it is it is more than just a police officer systematic thing. It's a society again a societal thing. Right. Okay. More questions. Um, <laughs> I'm Antoine. Um, kind of calling back to um, the um, police you know, uh, filing complaint against the police. Um, you know, I'm only uh, 22 years old, 1993, um, <laughs> and over the years, I'm only really just now kind of actually hearing the exact details of how to file, you know, um, a complaint against, you know, not that I've ever been wrong, but, you know, this kind of information is something, you know, um, I don't think gets out enough in a way. And I was wondering, do you think, is there any way you guys can maybe take a step or we can help you guys take a step in getting more attached to like modern media to help kind of these more smaller but more very important policies get known to the public and kind of talk at a more common base level. Any ideas? Well, that's like every forum that I go to, I talk about, you know, our, the ability for a citizen to make a complaint. And I think we talked about earlier about using social media in different ways that people can report that to us. Um, but the biggest thing is, you know, the leader of the organization, you know, uh, Chief Gill deals with his complaints, I deal with mine, you know, and I want, every form I get to, you know, our department, we want to be transparent. We want to know what's, I want to know what's going on out there, like the football situation. I learned that about 11 o'clock at night. Like I said, I mauled over for a second which way it was going to go, because I knew the next day I'd have to deal with this thing. 
you know, and, and how we have acted at our police department to make people feel comfortable. And just a quick story, because it's a, like a reality case. We had an individual come into my, um, my office and complain about how an officer treated his daughter on a traffic stop in the inner city. And he was standing at the desk. Now, I could have been cold and callous with him and say, you know, okay, we'll go over to the desk and fill out the packet and blah, 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 and in two weeks. And I, and I just at that, st at that second, I felt that wouldn't be appropriate. And so I just turned to, to one of my captains, who's our internal investigator, I said, hey, um, light up the video from last night, that traffic stop. Let's see if we got a copy of that. Let's watch it together. Now, I hadn't seen this thing before. So I'm going to watch it with the citizen for the first time. But I have trust and faith in my officers. We train, we have policies, we have procedures. I see their track record. And after 10 minutes of watching the video, and that citizen knew I couldn't doctor it or edit it or whatever, it just came up and we watched it. He, I saw some things that I could maybe talk to the officer on to, to do a little better, because we are in perfect service, okay? We're not perfect. But at the same time, the father turned to me and goes, you know, I think the daughter was kind of pulling my leg a little bit because the audio and the video was there. And I'm not trying to dismiss her, but I'm just trying to show that complaint ended right then and there because we had the dash cam video. I didn't put them off. You know, um, we resolved it right then and there. And so we try to do that when we can. I can't always do that, but it was appropriate right then. And that's how I want people to see us. Oh, yeah, just a quick follow-up question. Um, kind of your opinions on, you know, the whole, you know, football, the police officers play football. Do you think it should be um, more common and what is okay and safe for, you know, seeing officers, you know, get involved spontaneously with the community like that? You know, do you think it doesn't really put anyone at risk because, you know, our communications and technology that we have today? Real quick, they, they, have, they have to consider officer safety at all times. It's not always fun of games out there. But there are many times when officers seize an opportunity and they feel comfortable to do that. And I think all of us can name a time when something like that occurred to where before you know it, you're just, you're out there in the field. We still make house calls and we don't charge. That occurs. And so I just had a case recently where an officer went to a breaking and entering. And at the end of the call, the woman was more concerned that she could not secure her door. We don't have carpenters that work for us. He happens to be very good at carpentry. He goes off duty, he goes home, he buys the parts he needs, he goes back and he fixes her door jam. We don't train that, we don't advocate that. Um, he just did that on his own. I don't even recommend that he do that, but he did. And so for that, you know, I, you know, I gave him you know, an award for that and because it was really well, the football. Yeah. We're gonna address that too. But it's not something that we, I don't want that to be, to to identify who the officers are. It's gonna be spontaneous, it's gonna happen. I don't require it. Um, would you, Chief Lewis or, or uh, Chief Gill, uh, be in favor of having, say, a, a, a way to communicate directly with the Citizen Review Board rather than having to do an internal investigation and then that going to the uh, Citizen Review Board? Because some might be hesitant uh, given its current uh, process. <coughs> Well, the only problem is that if the Citizen Review Board is first, they won't have any information. An internal investigation, all it is is, is gathering of statements, facts, um, information, and then we put that together for them, and then, like the prosecutor, then, then they're allowed to read it, and, make, and they can actually ask for more or less. But if we just said, hey, go talk to them, it, it wouldn't be clean. Yeah. I mean, they wouldn't get... Both sides of the story. I we, think that the worry is it isn't clean if it goes through the We approach the, the, the uh, internal investigation pretty much as we would a criminal investigation. Uh -huh. We talk to all witnesses, review any video or audio, and all that goes into the, the, the investigation packet. Okay. And I wanted to address a little bit, I'm sure Darnell will uh, concur with this, uh, what this young lady was asking before. A lot of times things that citizens don't understand is that once you train a police officer, they're going to follow that training. If policies change, you might give them more training, but it's harder to break that old habit, especially if you've been doing it for 30 years. When you see somebody shoot 15 times, 
that to me right away tells me that's the way they were trained. Because I'm not going to use my firearm and empty it out where I have to reload if I don't know if I have more than one or two subjects. That's why a lot of agencies nowadays show or teach the double tap or triple tap and look. Uh, but it happens that we still have people that have been around for years that were trained that way or are militarily trained and that's the way the military teaches them. Spray and pray. Are the agencies going to be able to put the time, put the money to retrain these people and retrain them on a more regular basis? Qualifying once a year with a firearm is really not that adequate. They need to shoot more often, whether it fits on their own, and some agencies are able to afford to do that, uh, or whether if it is the agencies sponsoring them shooting every month or whatever it is. Anyone want to address that? Yeah, that, yeah there's, there's a difference. Um, as train, training back in the 1950s is it, it, a world of a difference from training now. Uh, it's it, it just, you, we do things different. Uh, just the, the handling of the firearm, the, 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 the method in which you, you, you shoot, uh, uh, just the whole, the whole process is different. So uh, back in 1950, you might have shot you know, 20 times or 18 times. Um, but at, at today's modern police officer, there's, there's not a likelihood that's going to happen. Uh, Andy, quick story, quick story. The two days after uh, Walter Scott was uh, shot either eight times, or shot at eight times South and Carolina. killed in South Carolina, two days after that in Italy, uh, a man shot, either killed or wounded three people in court, fled on motorcycle, and the police somehow apprehended him. Without yeah, I, I, I just there's a huge range of responses that we could ha possibly have. I just wanted to make sure that you know too. That I was referring to it says April 30, 2014, from this thing that they passed now. It says I passed. that this cop shot an unarmed African American with a history of mental illness because the cop thought he was homeless and he attempted to grab his baton. So there, you know, and he shot him 14 times because he attempted to grab his baton. That's what I was referring to. So it wasn't even like there was a gun fight or that there was this huge threat. He just attempted to grab his baton. He shot him 14 times. So that's what I was referring to. As, to me, that goes beyond excessive. I think that some of the training that we use is scary tactics to get these officers to remember and to build muscle memory. And that unfortunately lives and leads itself to some situations that might be excessive. By the way, this is our uh, criminal justice main instructor. If you'd like to be in criminal justice, this is the guy to talk to. <laughs> so. Okay, I, I think this is great to actually um, to have this type of conversation about the. What's going on? Yeah, we can't, we can't, we can't hear you. Can't hear you. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. And she put it back down. Okay. Um, I think this is great to have this discussion because, um, frankly, I'm exhausted and tired um, of all of the killing of uh, young black men by police officers. Um, I know all police officers are not um, bad. That's, that's a given. Um, but... Uh, I guess I would never get a chance to ask them, so I'm here, I came out from Grand Rapids to ask this question. Like, I don't understand why it is that other police officers don't hold the other police officers or the bad ones or the ones that are not being professional because they're, they're you know, educated to be professional, they're being paid to be professional, they're being in a trusted position. Why are the other officers not holding these officers responsible, you know, for their actions? Instead, instead, you know, it's like uh, oh, the wall goes up and this, it goes through this, you know, little courts and, you know, the officer gets off and then everybody closes ranks and nothing's like it, didn't, it doesn't happen. It didn't happen, you know. This 12-year-old didn't get killed. This 14-year-old didn't get shot, you know, 30 times. It's just unacceptable behavior. And I just want to know, because if it's me in whatever profession I'm doing, if there's people that are causing um, this negative outlook that are supposed to be professional like me, and they're doing this and they're just taking innocent lives because supposedly every police officer is doing this job to serve and protect. 
And if there are some that are not doing that, which clearly has been the case for who knows, you know, I mean, we, I'm not gonna go down that path, but clearly has been the case. Why don't we have more officers letting it know, letting it be known, this is not acceptable. I am not that type of officer. I do not respect these type of officers, and it's not acceptable. That is not what I want to re represent. And so, I need to know if can you answer that for me? Like, yes. Why, why we don't have that? Why? Yes. That's what the community needs. And okay. until we get that, I have no faith that. Um, anything will ever change as far as the police discrimination goes. Because that's where I think it needs to start at, so that the young, young um, non-whites or people of color can grow up and become officers without having a criminal record that started when they were juveniles, you know, that maybe bled over for something that possibly didn't warrant all of that because there is discrimination, you know. And so, yeah, if you can just answer that, thank you. Here's the answer. Here's the answer you don't hear about them. The ones who do stand up and go to the chiefs, you don't hear that. The ones who do stand up and say, you know, man, you're not, no, you didn't have to, you don't punch this dude when he's cuffed. You don't do that. You don't hear about that. All you hear are the negative things that do occur. That's all you hear you see. You don't hear about that. You don't hear about how often people are suspended. You don't hear about how often IMCOs, you can, it's public knowledge. It's absolutely public knowledge, but, but you tell you tell the news media to cover it for us. We'd love to have that. We'd love to have that. You tell the news media to cover it for us. Tell the news media. Tell. We don't disagree with you. We had the media. We love it. Mr. Blackburn, I just want to. I mean. I, I think you're and right here, often. I'm here. I'm right here right now. Yeah. I'm one of those people. These right. are one of those people. But, we can't stop everybody. But it, That's why we're here, honey. Right. <laughs> I, uh, you, you, but, you, you don't hear about. Hey, hey, hey. You, 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 uh, I think I think uh, Miss uh, Chief Gill has something yes, to say here. You, you don't hear about the internal uh, operations of the police department. You don't hear that uh, Chief Gill fired four people last year for for the, the thing. You know, but you, you, you don't you don't hear about those things. That's the media the media don't come in and say how many people you fired last year for inappropriate or or, or, or activities or, or being bad to a citizen. You know, and unfortunately we can't we can't go out and brag, hey citizen, I, I fired four people before. Well um, I, I guess uh, I, I would just uh, to help out a little here and backing up. If you're right this is going on, we just don't hear about it, why do we still have these statistics that Mr. Budenmir and other po pulled up about? Uh, African Americans getting arrested more, prosecuted more harshly, things like that. I mean, it, well, well, the, the statistics are. I tell you what, we have open meetings once a month. MCOs does the commission meetings. Come and watch our revocations. Come and see how we we suspend officers, we re or revoke officers' licenses because of these types of things. Come and see. But again, a lot of times they have to rise to the level of them being convicted of a felony, which is a problem. Go mm -hmm. write your legislature. Help us. Okay. <laughs> It, M I'm saying M, M C O L E S. M and then C O L E S. It's in, it's in your program, M by the way. It's Michigan oh. Commission on Law Enforcement Standards. That's what it is. Uh, next question. Here. Thank you. I agree with you over there. Uh, the gal that just was talking. Totally. Um, I, I get the feeling sitting here that everything's okay. You know, and nothing's okay. Nothing's okay. I don't know if we have. No, 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 no. Don't laugh. Don't laugh. It's not funny. Don't shake your head. We are agreeing with you. We are no, no. There's way too much smiling and glad heading going on here. We've got huge problems in this country. It's not okay. We agree with you. No, it's not. Well, then let's let's look at. I won't be invited back. Can I finish? Go ahead. When you travel into the third world, and you run into cops, it's bad. It's real, real bad. They're never there on your side. They're never there on your side. I don't know if we have got more pictures out now, but the stuff that is going on in this country is so unjust. 
since the Ferguson, since we were here in February, I mean, we just had the one, the one guy shot 11 times down in South Carolina. You had the kid in Baltimore last night. You got stuff going on all over the place. Do you sit down with your officers and watch these videos and talk about these videos directly? Do you sit down with your officers and review game film of your own, of your own cameras so that these things don't happen? We are at a juncture in this country that this is not okay. There's nothing good about it. And for you, uh, Mr. Hilton, in the middle, to say, well, all people protect their own. Well, you know, it's not okay. You're a public servant. You have to be held to a higher standard than all people. And, and this is just not, none of this is good. You know, I, I guess, be careful of how you take what I say in context, and I don't appreciate being misquoted or misrepresented. Well, you all I, wrote down what you said. All I said was, is that we, we, as a, in a society, what we deal with, what I deal with as a prosecutor, because I can't prosecute a case when I don't have a witness coming forward. So if it's an officer-related event and officers aren't coming forward, that's a problem for me. If it's a citizen event and citizens aren't coming forward, that's a problem for me. That's the point I was making. Yeah, but you did say that when officers, the officers close ranks because they're just like other people and that that's what people do too. I mean, I typed up what you yeah, said that, here. Yeah, that I was giving an example. Yeah, and that's, that's not it. okay because I agree. Officers, I agree. That's I'm with you okay. 100%. I don't like it. I don't like it. Um, I, a follow up on that. He's talked about all these cases we've heard, you know, and, and it and it is probably because uh, we've got social media and we didn't used to. Yeah, um, Muskegon had a case of uh, is it William Griffin, who uh, was this was probably before your time, but he was uh, sprayed with um, pepper spray and said, "I can't breathe, I can't breathe," and then he uh, died. Uh, he had a lot of other health complications. Um, are you familiar with that case at all, uh, Chief uh, Lu or Director Lewis? And and uh, and what happened? How how was that handled internally by our police department? You, you, you know, know? I, I I can't speak about that case because there are situations like that, and that's why we want to look at every single facet of what occurred. Because I've been involved in those type of cases in other departments, and a lot of times what happens is, and you just mentioned a couple of things, it is that that excited delirium when somebody. And this happens to officers and it also happens to suspects. When a suspect, let's say, and I don't know the circumstances, but I'm gonna talk about a case we had down in the Ypsilanti area. We had an individual that was a known drug user for decades, um, frequent contacts, negative contacts with the police, arrest after arrest after arrest. The individual, the, the local drug team had done an entry and this sounds similar to this. And when they got in the home, the individual, individuals in there fought with the police. He, he fought with the police. He was subsequently tasered as part of that. Um, and then the scene was put under control. He was, he was restrained with handcuffs. He remained at the scene for a couple hours. He complained that he had some medical situations. Um, at that point, an ambulance was called. Um, he was unhandcuffed. He was put into an ambulance. He was taken to the... Um, to the uh, uh, emergency room where he was now starting to really suffer from some issues, um, low blood pressure, couldn't breathe. He, he died within about eight hours of that taser, okay? There were a lot of medical problems that he had. He was treated, I mean, he was transported, he was treated, and then he died. When I first read the report, it said, taser-related death. That's the first thing that came out. When you read the whole medical examiner's report, this individual had terminal illness. I mean, he had so many problems with his health, and he was weakened by 20 years of drug use, alcohol abuse, not taking care of himself, diet, you name it, and all kinds of, of health issues. And as soon as he expires because of this, and he had that excited delirium, yeah. they blame the taser. And that really bothered me because if, if there was way more to it than that. If someone says to a police officer, I can't breathe, how should, I mean, I'm sure sometimes people are faking it, but, and, and maybe that's what police officers think. Or I know uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin has decided to just automatically, immediately call, the, call an ambulance when someone says that. And I couldn't agree with you more. Right now we just implemented a taser. Read my policy. Even if we taser you, okay, 
We want a medical evaluation because we don't always believe the person. You know what we don't believe when they say? They go, I'm okay, I don't want medical. They say that to us, we don't believe them. We want to have a medical professional come, whether it's a firefighter, paramedic, medical first responder, or an ambulance. So, come so my right, if, if someone says, I can't breathe, you'll immediately call an uh, ambulance, is that right? I'm telling you this as a police officer, somebody can't breathe. Number one, if they're talking to me, that helps me understand they are breathing something. But I hear them, and I will do what I can to put them in a, in a situation that they can breathe better, but I have to think about their safety and my <coughs> safety too. And if you've ever been in those situations, they can be very stress, stressful for the actual defendant, or, you, know, or the, you know, the perpetrator, person, whatever you want to call them, and the officer. Those are really difficult times that we have to get through. That's why I beg for the, the person to cooperate with me. If I feel any kind of cooperation coming, I can give that too. But I'll tell you, you gotta be, you gotta be in the shoes of an officer. Males and females, black and white, Hispanic, Korean, we're officers. And let me tell you something, when things are going bad on the street, and I've been there for a lot of years, it's a problem. And all I want is to get that under control and get some cooperation. I didn't come to this job to hurt anyone, and I've had a great, successful career, and I've spent a lot of time on the road in patrol cars, you can Google it, um, and I've had really difficult situations, and, and a lot of things have worked out for me, but I'll tell you, I've seen a lot of situations that didn't work out so well, and I'll tell you what, but in those, in those circumstances, we do want to help you, but we can't give up our safety or theirs if they are not suffering and that's why we look we've been trained in medical if someone's going i can't breathe i can't breathe i can't breathe it's like the highland maneuver if they're coughing don't pound on their back you could knock the piece of meat down into their lungs you're looking at their signs and you're kind of standing there watching like hey they're coughing that means that even though they're choking they're coughing that's a good sign and that's like that we have to monitor on a second by second basis on how they're doing all right uh, the mic has been chased down. <laughs> Look out. Gloria. The, sheriff, the sheriff and I almost had a meltdown over there waiting for the mic, so I decided to chase it down. Thank you. Um, I forgot what I even wanted to address, so I'll start with the Citizens Police Review Board, since I was one of the ones that helped form that. And many of the young people in this room, I'm glad that you here, probably have no idea why it was started, and maybe some of you up at the dais have no idea. But there were a lot of problems in Muskegon, Muskegon Heights as it related to the police department. And so I was the director of the Urban League, and we talked with people at the Justice Department and the then police chief and city manager of Muskegon about having a citizens police review board. So it was formed because there were issues and concerns to be addressed. The Citizens Police Review Board cannot be any more effective than its leader and the leaders of the cities and the police departments themselves. And I had always suggested that there should be younger people, some young people on that board as well. Many of the agencies, the three, um, nonprofit agencies that were a part of starting that board don't even exist now. So that's probably why you don't know, and many people don't know, because there is no Urban League. Um, I can't speak for the NAACP, although I'm a member of the NAACP, and the Nation of Islam. Those were the three that were at that time part and parcel to the formation of the Citizens Police Review Board. Young people are correct. They have no faith in some of the systems because they don't hear about it, they don't know about it. But I'm telling you, you have to be engaged. I was 19 and still in nursing school when I started doing things civically, socially, and politically. You must be engaged, you must have your voices heard, and you must be involved. No, law enforcement is all wrong, but it's not all right either. And it is difficult recruiting because 
Most people that I see that go into law enforcement or criminal justice, rather, they start working at the prisons, okay? Many of them are not on the police forces. So we do have to go around in other parts of the country and recruit young people or graduates from college that are willing not only to relocate to Muskegon and, and Muskegon Heights, because when the Citizens Review Board was formed, there were African Americans on the force. So there are many variables that come into play as to why that board is needed. And people should challenge the fact, if you don't think the Citizens Police Review Board is effective, you haven't heard about it, make inquiry. It's public information. So I'm just challenging you, and thank you for the mic. <laughs> So yeah, I, I think we've seen a, a good standard here to, to follow uh, in Gloria. I noticed she has a Fitbit on, so it's probably you wanted to get some extra steps in as well. Here's, here's another question over here. Hello, everyone on the panel. I just want to say hi. Um, my question is this, um, especially to Mr. Blackburn and Mr. Gill. Um, as you can see, it's not a a lot of black people in here now. Um, and I think just because of the interaction, especially um, uh, most of our black kids, they come from inner cities which are overpopulated with police because a lot of crime happens in the smaller inner cities. And I just think through experience that we, that for the most part, not all, but for the, but for the most part, we have bad experiences with police. So to try to get a black man to really become a police officer it is going to be tough. Because for one, when we see a new jail built, we say that's for black people. When we, see, when we see a new prison built, we say that's for black people. I'm pretty sure white people, no offense, don't go by jails or prisons and say, hey, they built a new prison for us. No, they don't. I might get a job there. <laughs> might get a job there, but it ain't built for us. So that's. That's the big discrepancy between why I feel black men would not join the police force. Not saying that they won't, but there's a lot of hurdles to get over. And anybody that's ever been through the court system uh, and had to face a judge, um, I would say most people would say, not Mr. Hilson, of course, or, or, or any of the prosecutors because they're doing their job, you just bring in charges. But when you get in that system, the court system is prejudiced. And it's been prejudiced for so many years that it's just systematically imposed in there. I mean, most people don't even notice it. But you can have a black man and a white man with the exact same charges, same criminal history. And more than not, that black man is going to go to jail if there's a jail sentence imposed. But we're going to get more of the the, the white person would get more of a better shake, is what I'm saying, than what a black man. So we already have a, just a low disposition of our criminal justice system. So I think that needs to really be addressed. Um, everybody that makes the decisions are not of color, most. I mean, we got two men up here, thank God, that does have some power that can make some decisions. Most people that I meet or walk into, they don't have, uh, they're not people of color and they don't have the power to even make the decision. So how can, from all of you guys, think that, what do you feel would be a way that a black man can get into a system where there's no black man in charge? Can, can I go Let's first? Go address ahead. that. Man, I thank you so much. First and foremost, awesome. I really thank you. Because you, you, bring up, you bring up some absolute points. Um, I'll say this, and, and I can't, you know, I, my personal belief, there are some cultural biases, absolutely. And there's some things, let me give you guys just a quick example, I'll be really brief. Um, you get a, a speeding ticket, you get a ticket, a person gets a ticket, they gotta go to work. They can't afford to pay that speeding ticket. What happens is they go to work, they don't pay the ticket, it becomes a warrant, 
or your license is ultimately suspended. You get stopped again and you're going to work. Here's where that discretion comes in because that's a minor offense, discretion. Man, I pull you over, your license is suspended, man. I'm just trying to get to work. See, here's my ID, here's my badge, I'm going to work. Look, man, you got to go get to work. That's discretion. But next officer may not be as nice. I can't control that. I don't know what, Im what implicit biases this other officer has. All I know is what I can do. So you're right. What happens is it, it's cultural, it's economical. If you can't pay that, what happens is it's a system. It keeps piling up and piling up and building up. So here's what happens. When you get that ticket, you got to go to the court. I'm pointing to him. He's not the judge, but he's close. <laughs> you got to go to court. You got to go to court. And you got to say, hey, listen, judge or honor, magistrate, I'm working. I got this ticket. Can I get a restricted license? It's all about education. And that's why we are here. And I'm speaking specifically for the two of us and me. This is my personal passion, man. This, I got cards for you, those of you who want them. If you know people, anybody, good people, but more specifically minorities who want to get in and get in. Here's what you do. You go back and you say, we got this system that needs to be infiltrated. Integrated and infiltrated. It needs to be changed. We got chiefs, we got the state representative for all police departments saying, we need minorities. Hey man, you know, you're at the bar. I'm, last part. I'm at the barbershop before I came here because I wanted to look good, you know. I ain't got that much hair, but I'm at the barbershop. Some guy named John. I just got here, never been to Muskegon. Go to the barbershop. I'm talking to him. I said, man, after we got done, hey, man, here's my car. This is what I'm doing. I'm going to this forum now. If you know some, he had about four young black kids, 13 years of age, in the shop. None of them related to him, just hanging out. Awesome. Because they're not in the street. I said, listen, man, I need you to push these kids and try to get them to get into law enforcement. So that's the part that you can play. We need you to do this. I know it's hard, man. I agree. Can I I make, and I've been discriminated yeah, um, against the police too before. Can I make uh, one, quick, one quick comment too on that, on that, on that, on that point? Uh, we've got the captain of the state police sitting in the audience and uh, I didn't, he didn't ask me to highlight him, but he's here. And, and I can tell you, and I wanna highlight the state police for this very, as we talk about recruitment. Uh, the state police every year uh, holds a academy, a, a week-long academy uh, every, I don't know how many times a year, how many times in the summer, but they reach out to different cities and, and try to get kids to come and see what it's all about. This summer, we've got two camps for Muskegon, one for Muskegon Heights and one for the city of Muskegon, where we're going to bring 15 to 20 young men and young ladies that want to come and learn about what it's like to be in the state police to spend time at the, at the academy. And there, there's two reasons for that. One, they get a sense as to what it's all about. And two, maybe it sparks an interest. Uh, because believe me, we, we are all of a like mind here. I want, just like I try to make my office to look like the community, I want departments to look like the community. And we're, we're making those efforts. And it, it, what's great is, is that we had one for Muskegon Heights, and the state police said, you know what? We want to offer something for the city of Muskegon, too. We added a second one. So that, that's the kind of effort that law enforcement is actually trying to do to make things happen and, and try to spark those interests. All right, that, that's very good. I, and I, I just want to back up this very good question as well um, with uh, a study that was done by uh, Sonia Starr from University of uh, Michigan. She's a law professor there. And she's found uh, that her study with uh, uh, Rahavi uh, says that uh, black Americans have 60% longer sentences for the same crime than non-black Americans. So, uh, and you might say, well, that's the judge's problem, that's not ours. But they actually say it's the prosecutors, that prosecutors are more likely to charge black men with crimes that require minimum sentences uh, than non-black men. Listen, I can't control 83 prosecutors' offices throughout the state. I only control my office. And I'm telling you, like I said before, we don't practice that. I don't preach that. I Have don't you do it examined myself. your statistics to make sure that they don't reflect that? What I what I examine is how many cases have I charged per year? What are we doing to try to make things better, i.e. adult diversion, juvenile diversion? What other programs can I get involved in to help uh, wayward kids like Fresh Start and Stay and other and other programs, how can I better improve? So I don't see these kids when they're 17, 18. I, I really don't want to see them. You know, I, I'm the president of the Boys and Girls Club. All right, we brought a Boys and Girls Club here to Muskegon to offer these kinds of opportunities to young kids throughout the county. Uh, so, I mean, 
Yeah. Again, I mean, so I, I guess I, I, I look at it as a, how do I, not at the back end, but how can I help at the front end? Okay. Uh, and that's really important to me. All can, right. Can I, I think we have that? one more question here, and then, um, um, but go ahead, Chief Lewis. Well, and then yeah, we'll I, just, I just want to say, you know, he, he presents this information, and I'm, I'm not going to challenge that study, and I'll stipulate to that information, but it doesn't tell me anything, because what we're doing in Muskegon we're trying to fix a lot of stuff that our community sees. And real quick, this is my fourth forum for a justice for all. But I'll tell you, Tuesday night I went to a special one. And Dave Alexander from M Live was there. He was the one that, that kind of keyed that whole thing. I was stunned because there was probably about 95% African American there, correct? Males. Males. Mm -hmm. And I go, okay, we're going to have a good night here. All of a sudden, we had the most productive conversation that I could believe because they started attacking what they could do to start solving these problems. The blame game had stopped, and they started talking amongst themselves. Dave, were you pretty amazed at what came, what was, what was spoken that An night? Amazing night, Gosh. Church, and that was a good, good step towards hopefully making things better. Yeah, because they started challenging themselves to attack the problems they're seeing, like this one individual up there, and they said, when we leave today, the information we got, we want to do something about it. And we told them what we're doing about it, and it created kind of a positive, joyful, um, you know, forum. And I walked away wanting to try harder to fix these problems. I hate leaving these things empty, like everybody said their opinions, all their statistics, and we leave, and then tomorrow's the same. Well, I, 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 don't, I, I just want to defend yeah. myself. Yeah. These statistics help point out systematic problems, and they may or may not apply to the city. Yeah. And, I and, so, and, and so I, I, I think I it's, that. we want to see. Maybe they don't apply. Maybe we're better than the rest, but maybe we're not. Yeah. Well, I think we know there's a problem, and darn it, we're tackling these things the best way we can. We don't like it, the stuff we see, and we are going to try to fix this um, one way or another. Uh, my comment is for the prosecuting attorney. Um, you mentioned that you're fair, you don't look at color, but you also mentioned that depending on the complaint, how hard you go after the person. What if your complainant is prejudice? Well, I can tell you I haven't run into that. <laughs> I, I haven't. I mean, I, I'm serious, I haven't. Because you know what, most of the, most of the crime that happens usually is their, their relatives, uh, neighbors, uh, aunts, uncles, grandmothers, grandfathers. I mean, th those conversations. Uh, I have never, it, it, and, I, and I'll say this, if for one second I thought I was sitting next to a victim that was doing it for the wrong reasons, I don't have to, I mean, I listen to victims. I don't have to follow what they say. If I, if I feel that I have to do something right and different, we're going to go that way. Uh, believe me, I, I, we're not robots. Is that, uh, is that true for victimless crimes too, like drug offenses? Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing. I mean, listen, an unfortunate thing is, is that drug crimes are usually the, if you go to the root of a lot of what we deal with, it's That's either drugs or alcohol. Right. Right. You know, and that, and the difficulty is, is that, you know, there isn't a great system in place to help s solve or correct those problems. Mm -hmm. You know, the treatment well, is what I'm talking about. And so, as far as criminal justice is concerned, we're, we're handcuffed a little bit and how we do that uh, but yeah I mean it's the, it's the same thing okay one last question because his hands up it's been I, 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 I'm sorry here you go Lynn. I have you ignored me <laughs> <laughs> all right and I guess it's kind of for the for everyone on the table right now uh, but from what I've overheard, I actually work in the mailing room at MCC, and I remember asking someone who worked in the uh, 142 or the business department and right, talked about uh, f how the feeling about prejudice. And chief, out of the chief, felt the biggest problem was the fact that there's a big problem of fear. And I, while I can't quite agree with it entirely, I can say that fear does play a huge part in prejudice, whether it's race or. Being in, j being in jail or drug, like alcohol, what do you have you? And I'm just wondering, do you think it's plausible at this point that there we could find some way to kind of start alleviating that, to kind of inform, to say, hey, let's start getting rid of this fear, the prejudice, what, whatever the root of it is, whether it's race or what have you? Very good question. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Do you want to address anybody I'm not fair? to talk to <laughs> <laughs> I'm like Jay-Z on this microphone, man. <laughs> 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 well, Andy, I, I could... Okay, uh, Mr. Budimir. Yeah, I, I can be Beyonce then. <laughs> wow. Oh, oh. That, was, that was very low. Sorry. Um, but uh, my student, Landon, is a, is a very wonderful person, uh, and he... He has actually surprised me throughout the two classes. Um, he's very unique among students uh, who is actually, he is enraged and outraged at all of the statistics that I give about um, African Americans make uh, 55 cents on the dollar for every the dollar a white man makes, et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, my point is, or what I would like to see come out of the Ferguson issue, the Eric Garner issue, the um, um, shooting of Walter Scott is, I would love for there to be a social movement of people and I would lo absolutely love there to be a social movement that involved uh, caring police officers, prosecutors that came together and said, let us try to reform policing technique where it needs reform, but also I would love for prosecutors and police to join with those concerned students to seriously reform drug laws, uh, basically legalize marijuana, uh, uh, reduce... Don't get me started uh, on that, Nick. Don't get me started. We'll be here for another two hours. A reform of sentencing, uh, and seriously, what, what these should drive towards what this kind of thinking because the public, at least part of the public, is uh, energized finally after 30 some years over these issues. Maybe now we, it's a good time to use this sort of issue to bring up the serious issue of poverty and joblessness and economic redistribution. So I'll, I'll all right, I, I, uh, we got to wrap things up. It's 8 o'clock. Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, part of change comes from our panelists willing to be here and answer these questions and be on the hot seat. So let's thank them all very much for being here.